For this video series, we've partnered up with MegaRide to discuss the most important parameter of a car's performance, the tires. In our first episode, we'll discuss how tire forces are generated and how to make sure that you maximize the grip of your tires. Hello everyone, this is Bruno. We are glad to be partnering with MegaRide to provide you with advanced content on tire performance. MegaRide and Visivo not only contribute with a lot of the content you see here, but now we can use their models and their devices to quantify and analyze tire grip. If you are curious to know more about their models and their devices, go ahead and check the link in the video description. All external forces on the car, besides aerodynamic forces, are going through the tires. The tire grip will dictate how hard you can brake, how fast you can take corners and how hard you can accelerate all of them. Not only that, but the balance between front and rear grip will dictate if your car will understeer or oversteer. But how are these tire forces generated exactly? It is all connected to tire sliding. So let's first consider a car that is driving a straight line. The velocity vector of the contact patch is aligned with the tire. Now, if we take a corner, the velocity vector is not aligned with the tire direction anymore and this generates a slip angle. As a consequence, we'll get a longitudinal speed and a lateral speed in the car coordinate system. As you can see in this video, this lateral speed is basically the tire is sliding sideways, and this sliding is exactly what is generating the lateral force. We could also get longitudinal sliding while we are braking or accelerating, which will then generate longitudinal forces. All right, so we understand it's connected to sliding, but what are the exact grip mechanisms that generate these lateral and longitudinal forces? Here, we'll discuss the two main grip mechanisms. The first one being adhesion. In this case, it's a molecular interaction between the tire and the road surface, and for that, we need direct contact between these surfaces. The second mechanism we'll study is the hysteretic grip. So the tire is deforming over the road asperities and it will generate forces as well. For that, we require sliding. Let's first discuss adhesion grip. As we can see, it requires direct contact between the tire and the asphalt. Once we have this direct contact, van der Waals forces are generated. So they have an attraction to each other, and when you try to slide, it's going to create a reaction force, which is basically the lateral or longitudinal forces that we see. Since direct contact is needed, if there is anything that prevents that, our adhesion grip will be decreased. For example, if we have a wet surface, it will have a water film between the tire and the surface, decreasing the grip. Besides that, if we have mud and oil coming because of a rainfall, it will also decrease the grip. So in this example, we can see even a river crossing the road and bringing mud to the top of it. After the rain, we cannot clearly see this mud anymore, but obviously we have the track a lot dirtier. And this is what we call a green track after a rainfall. Not only that, this water can resurface oils that before were at the bottom of the asperities. Also, when we have a dusty or sandy track, it will also decrease our adhesion grip. So think of tracks that are near deserts or street circuits. We'll see a lot of progression over the sessions. For example, we see a big lap time change between FP1 and FP2. And one of the reasons for that is that as the track gets cleaner from the cars driving, the adhesion grip will improve. Besides that, we have to keep in mind that roads are not perfectly smooth. So in this case, we can see all of the stones and the details on the asphalt surface. And if we scan to understand what exact points or how much the tire surface is really in contact with the surface, we can see that sometimes it's a minority of the contact area. So for example, in this case, we have third, only 35% contact. So we can also start seeing that a compound that allows for more contact, for example, a softer compound, could also help um, generate more grip. The next mechanism we'll study is the hysteretic grip. Here, we have the rubber sliding and deforming over the asperities of the asphalt. It will experience some resistance due to its viscoelastic properties. Not only that, this hysteresis causes asymmetric force distribution that will then create the horizontal forces, lateral or longitudinal, as we'll see in more details now. 
So first of all, what is a viscoelastic material? In this case, we're looking at the tire rubber. Well, it is a combination of an elastic material that can be thought of as a spring with its energy storage properties and also a viscous material, such as a damper with its energy dissipation properties. Since we have this energy loss properties, it generates hysteresis in the material, as we can see in this plot. As we apply the force and release it, the profile of force versus displacement is not the same because the input and output are not in phase. This creates energy dissipation in the form of heat and therefore more damping or energy loss will also mean more hysteresis in the material. A good way to visualize this hysteresis in the material, which can also be seen in the tires, is with this video. We can see that as we apply the force and we remove this force, the deformation is not directly proportional. There is a delay, there is a phase between input and output. So now let's apply this knowledge to the rubber of the tire. In a simple condition that the tire is static on top of the road surface, we see that we have the asperities from the asphalt and we have a symmetrical stress distribution. Because of that, we have a purely vertical force. Now, if we start to slide this tire, it will face some resistance due to the viscoelastic properties of the material. And not only that, because of the hysteresis properties that we discussed, the tire is not reverting back to its original position. So we have forces only on one side of the asperity. We have to also remember that even in this region here, we have some adhesion grip that is also pulling the rubber. Well, all of these factors together will create an asymmetrical stress distribution as we can see here. If we take a closer look at this asymmetrical stress distribution, we can see that we have a resultant force that is not perfectly vertical, but also has a horizontal component, which will be the lateral force or the longitudinal force. Even though there are a lot more nuances to this hysteretic grip, these examples at least give an intuitive understanding of how it works. All right, so we are done with analyzing adhesion grip and hysteretic grip, but we also saw that the viscoelastic properties of the rubber will influence each of them. So what are exactly these viscoelastic properties? We will start discussing the storage modules. The storage modules is basically a measure of the rubber's elastic behavior. So if we have a higher number, it means that the material is harder, while a lower number indicates that this material is softer. Besides that, we have two very distinct regions for this type of material. We have the glassy region on the left side. At low temperatures, the material will behave more like a glass. It's a very hard material. While on the right side, we have the rubbery region, meaning that if we warm up this material, it will behave more as a rubber. And between these two regions, we have a very specific point called glass transition temperature where the material goes from a glassy behavior to a rubbery behavior. The second property we'll study is the loss factor, also called 10 delta. The loss factor is a measure of the rubber's viscous behavior. So a higher number will indicate more energy loss, while a lower number will indicate less energy loss. In the same way, we'll have the glassy region and the rubber region that for this particular property, both of them will have a low energy loss characteristic. And we have the middle segment that has very high energy loss characteristics. The peak of the energy loss is actually what characterizes the glass transition temperature of this material. And now we can see both of these properties together. They will both dictate a lot of what happens with the rubber when sliding over the asphalt. Now that we understand the main viscoelastic properties, we need to connect them back with tire grip. Even though this is, a, again, a very complex subject, in simplified terms, we could connect the storage modules with the adhesion grip and the loss factor with the hysteretic grip. Let's see how. First, we start with the storage modules and its connection with adhesion. If we are looking at low temperatures or a hard compound, we can see that the compound is not really going down over the asperities and we're only getting a small fraction of contact between the surface and the tires. Now, if the tire is warmer or if we're using a softer compound, the compound can go deeper in the road asperities and we see that we have a lot more contact, direct contact, contact that is able to generate adhesion forces.
So this is one of the ways that storage modules is connected with adhesion. Well, it would also influence hysteretic grip since you have more places to have indentations from the track surface. Now let's discuss how the loss factor is heavily connected with the hysteretic grip. If we're at very low temperatures or high temperatures, we have low energy loss and therefore low hysteresis. Because of that, we don't have such a big asymmetrical force distribution. And therefore, we don't create as much lateral or longitudinal forces. Now, if we're close to the glass transition temperature or we have a compound with more hysteresis, we generate a more asymmetrical force distribution resulting in a higher lateral or longitudinal force. So this is how we understand how increasing the loss factor could also increase the hysteretic grip. After discussing the viscoelastic properties and we understand how they connect with tire grip in simplified terms, we should ask ourselves how can we measure these viscoelastic properties to understand our tires. A conventional way to measure these viscoelastic properties is through DMA testing. So in this example, we need a sample of the material, for example, the rubber from the tire, and the rig will characterize this rubber at different temperatures and different, different frequencies. So here we are measuring the stress or the force, the strain or the deformation, and we're analyzing also the phase between them. With that, we are able to characterize the two properties we discussed, the storage modules and the loss factor. Here we can see it being done for soft, medium or hard materials. The disadvantage of this test is number one, you have to do that in a lab. And number two, it's a destructive test. You need to destroy your tire to create this sample. Another option for measuring such viscoelastic properties is using the Visevo device that I had the chance of using together with Megaride and the Visevo companies. The device works by releasing an indenter always from the same height. It can then measure how the indenter is bouncing over the tire and from there we can characterize the tire. We can perform such measurements over a temperature range. So here we can see the bouncing profile at different temperatures and from that the software is able to extract the storage modules and the loss factor, as we see here, compared versus a typical DMA measurement. The main advantage of such a method is that it's non-destructive, meaning that we can do these measurements with our tires without losing them. We can also do them at the track or in the field, so we can characterize the tire in different conditions to understand how its properties are working. Now let's have a look at examples of measuring these properties and some real case scenarios provided by Megaride and Visevo. In this first plot, we are analyzing the storage modules for different types of tires. So for example, we can see a GT tire, rally, racing slick, motorbike, passenger car tires. It's very interesting to compare all of these different types to understand how they are designed differently. Not only that, since we perform these measurements over a temperature range, we could analyze the passenger car tire at the specific condition where it operates, and also a racing slick in blue, for example, at the higher temperatures that it operates. And we can compare both of them and see that the racing slick, for example, will have a lower storage modules compared to the passenger car tire. Besides that, we could also look at the loss factor. Again, comparing a racing slick in blue, we can see that at high temperatures, it will have a higher loss factor or more hysteresis, helping the hysteretic grip, then compared to a passenger tire, for example. Besides that, we can see what happens with the tires as we wear them at the track. So for example, we could compare a brand new tire with a tire with over 100 kilometers to see how this is changing the storage modules and the loss factor to try and make sense of what the tire is displaying at the track. Besides that, sometimes we have a batch of tires that is not very good due to manufacturing issues. Therefore, Viscoelastic property measurements could be a good way to do a quality check. In this case, we're comparing the tires in green and in red. Here we can see that this bad batch that we identified using the Visevo is showing a lot less loss factor and therefore hysteresis compared to what we would expect in green. So it's a very good way to confirm that the issue is coming from the tires, but not from the car. Another example would be to understand what happens with the tire compound if we warm it up for one hour, for example, as we can see in this example in red, or for four hours in black. How is this curing process while we are keeping the tires warm before a session influencing the compound behavior of the tire? This can be quantified if we have a device with us at the track. So in this video, we understood the origin of tire forces, which is the tire sliding, the grip mechanisms that generate these forces and create tire grip, 
adhesion and hysteretic grip. After that, we studied viscoelastic properties and how they affect the grip mechanisms. And lastly, we saw how we can measure these viscoelastic properties. You now have a better understanding of where tire forces are coming from and what increases or decreases them, as well as things you can do to maximize the grip of your tires at the track. We very much appreciate the contribution of MegaRide and Visivo to this episode, because it made it possible for us to show you a lot of the content you saw here. If you're curious to know more about their work and their products, you'll find a link to their website in the video description. If you're curious to know more about tire performance and vehicle dynamics in general, you'd love our seminars. We have a seminar fully dedicated to applied vehicle dynamics, where we discuss not only vehicle dynamics, but a lot more content on tires. And we also have a performance engineering seminar, where we teach you how to better analyze data, how to maximize the performance of the car, including tires, drivers, suspension, and so on. Besides that, we have a free of charge vehicle dynamics lecture. You can find a link to the seminar calendar and to the vehicle dynamics lecture in the video description. Besides that, Optimum G offers the following services. Performance engineering, where you could have one of our performance engineers with you at the track. Vehicle dynamics consulting, in all areas connected to simulation, testing, and vehicle dynamics development. And we also have simulation software. You could be interested in Optimum Tire 2, which is a really powerful software for analyzing tire data, tire models, and for automating your tire testing needs. If you are curious to know more about our work, you can go to our website. Thank you for watching the video. If you have any questions, please leave them in the comment section so that I can get back to you. And I'll see you in the next one.